Great. I want to say as a prelude to introducing our speaker, uh, Dave Lomas, will be uh, up in the D.C. following his sermon today for Q&A. And so we want to invite you to be part of that discussion following chapel this morning. In the 40 years that the Westmont in San Francisco program has been in operation, one of the great privileges we have is partnering with a wide range of organizations, businesses, churches, ministries throughout the city through the various internships that our students do. And our guest speaker this morning is one whose valued partnership has been really formative for us these past seven years. Uh, Dave Lomas was born and raised in the bustling metropolis of Bakersfield, California. Although he grew up in a loving home, his first exposure to an evangelical church was not until the fifth grade. He went once, that was that. Even though Dave spent most of his formative years drinking and partying, he made a conscious decision to go to church every Sunday morning. To this day, he can't explain why he made that decision outside of the seeking and saving nature of God. It was during the darkest time in these years that he opened his Bible and learned about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. He was discipled by a youth pastor at the church he was attending and eventually became their youth pastor. After serving in this position for several years, he met Britt Merrick, the founding pastor of Reality Carpinteria, who asked him if he wanted to start a church. God had been stirring Dave's heart to plant a church, but he didn't know where to start. He told Britt yes. And in 2007, Dave and his wife Ashley moved to Carpinteria to begin the process of planting with reality. Almost a year after arriving in Carp, God called Dave and Ashley to move to San Francisco to start Reality San Francisco, whose first service was in January of 2010. Dave now serves as pastor of preaching and vision at Reality San Francisco. Dave is also the author of a forthcoming book called The Truest Thing About You, Identity, Desire, and Why It All Matters. So we are really pleased this morning to welcome uh, Dave Lomas, pastor of Reality SF, uh, to join us this morning. Thanks, Brad. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you guys. Um, five years ago, I lived down the street in Carpinteria. Anyone from Carpinteria here? All right. Nice. Um, down, oh, you? Okay, cool. Um, down the street, uh, that's where I got fired from a bank. Uh, I worked at a bank, but I couldn't count, so that didn't like really go well together. And so I would give away money on accident. Um, oh, gosh. Um, I can still see it. I can still see it. I'm good. Well, yeah, I'm good. I don't know. I might do it again, though. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I have a strict time limit. Uh, and uh, I, got, I, I couldn't count, so that didn't really like, go over well for a bank, but I had good personality skills. And so, um, and so I would talk to people, but then I would forget to um, count the money, but I would just give them money. And so I just, people liked me because I gave them free money at the bank. But the bank didn't like that, so they fired me. So then um, at the age of 30, I worked at Starbucks. So I was the, a slave of the green apron for a while. And I put that on every morning at 4 a.m. and worked at a, in Carpinteria at a Starbucks. And then um, I also worked at a secure, as a security guard at Carp High. Anyone from Carp High in here? A couple? Yeah, right on. Yes, you. I remember you. No, I don't. Um, so I was a security guard at Carp High. So in the morning I would put on the green apron and, uh, and then I'd grab my keys and go to the school and like drive a golf cart until kids get back to class. And uh, it was there... Um, in the middle of like really an identity crisis for, for me, I was a pastor for a, a while before that, and then I was 30 years old, and my boss was like 18 at Starbucks, and then kids were calling me like young blood and stuff, like, hey, what are you doing here, young blood? You know, like we were in a Western or something like that. And um, it was there that it, God called me in the clearest voice I'd ever heard to move to San Francisco. And as that video shows, I, the city is a beautiful and amazing, probably one of the best cities in the world. But it was the clearest voice I heard, and I felt like San Francisco was everything I'm not. Here's a picture of uh, the painted ladies, if you know, if you've ever been. Ever, anyone not been to San Francisco? Oh, wow. Okay. I don't even want to talk. 
I don't know. I, I don't. Here's what one of my favorite authors said about San Francisco. San Francisco is the, the, the most left part of the left coast, the un-American place where America invents itself. I was called there, and I felt like San Francisco was everything I wasn't. Like, how in the world am I going to go to San Francisco when San Francisco is like one of the most hip, educated, progressive cities. I'm from conservative Bakersfield, California, where I know a bunch of growers, and I like barely went to a community college, and I could barely speak English. Like, how in the world <laughs> is God going to call me to San Francisco? Why in the world would he do that? And then I start studying the city and knowing how, how, in, how gnarly the city was. Here's one of my favorite books that came out recently. It's called Season of the Witch. Uh, it's not for the lighthearted. Um, and he, this is how he starts his book. This guy is David Talbot, the founder of Salon.com. And he writes this book about his love affair with San Francisco and how dark San Francisco is and how complex San Francisco is. And he just wants to give you a little taste about San Francisco. He wants to, in this opening page, just to slap you across the face with, this is the city we're talking about. And this is how he opens up his book. San Francisco was built on a dare, one of my favorite opening lines to any book. San Francisco was built on a dare. The city was tossed up overnight on a shimmying, heavy, mischievous crust of the Pacific Rim. A gold rush city of fortune seekers, gamblers, desperados, and fesh peddling circus that caters to such men. San Francisco defied the laws of nature. It was a wide open town. Its thighs played wantonly for every vice damned in the Bible and, a more, and more than a few that were left out. San Francisco was the last chance saloon for outcasts from every corner of the globe. If earth didn't swallow them first, hell soon enough would. Great cities have usually been founded by wealthy burghers and craftsmen. Their spires and monuments a testament to the holiness of the work ethic. But San Francisco High Society was a devil's dinner party, a rogue's crew of robber barons, saloon keepers, and shrewd harlots. When the town's painted ladies went to the theater, gentlemen would rise until they were seated. By 1866, there were 31 saloons for every place of worship. This is where God called me. And I was scared to death. I have a video somewhere on, on Vimeo or YouTube. I don't really know. I don't, I don't really try to look at it that much. But I'm sitting there talking about San Francisco. Like, why does it go? Scared to death. Like, what am I going to do in this city? We finally moved there. My wife and I finally moved there. We start prayer meetings. And we start the church in January. And we started in the book of Mark. I love the book of Mark. The book of Mark doesn't play around with like Jesus, his, his birth. He doesn't really play around with like what happened beforehand. He just gets right into it. Oh yeah, Jesus just showed up on the scene. He started like just baptizing and he started casting out demons. Like that's my kind of book. Like just get right into it. So I, we started through the book of Mark and I had this crazy idea that I just wanted to show people in San Francisco who Jesus was. And we did. And people started showing up. And more people started showing up. And more people started showing up. And then a couple months into it, we had to start two services. People were getting, we're, we're coming to get, we're following, we're coming, we're, we're getting saved and started following Jesus. We had our first baptism. Here's a picture. Under the Golden Gate Bridge, the dumbest, coolest thing we've ever done. <laughs> it was freezing cold. And um, I thought, I, I was kind of, I don't know, weird about like wearing a wetsuit while I baptize people because that's kind of weird. So I thought, I'll just put on a wool vest. And I'm like, wool vests get wet and get even colder. So I was we're out there freezing, and then Jason Stevens, you see him in the bottom picture, he's wearing a, a bucket fisherman's hat, and he ruined everyone's baptism photo, wearing a wife beater and a bucket hat, and um, he's the guy who wrote Psalm 23. Anyway, so this was, this, God, God was blessing the church, and God was growing the church, and we, people were coming to follow and know Christ in this church, and it was amazing. But here is the problem. Um... People were still sinning, like a lot in the church. And this was, and you wouldn't think this is like a thing, like, oh yeah, Christian sin, we get that. But it was, for me, it was, a, it was a dilemma. Like, people were coming to follow Jesus, and people were talking about Jesus, and people were inviting their friends, like, you can come to this church, you can experience Christ at this church. But then people were still sinning, they were still doing those things that, that they shouldn't be doing. And I wanted to dust off my youth pastor hat, and I was this close of going, okay, that's it. Everyone has to sign pledges. Everyone has to put on purity rings and promise rings. The whole church, like we're all taking, like we're all signing things. And I wanted to start giving them lists. Okay, once you start following Christ, you can do this and you can do that and you can't love him, you can't love her and don't do this and don't drink that. I wanted to do all these things to tell people to stop doing what they were doing. And then I read, I was, something clicked for me when I was reading Colossians. And have you ever read the Bible and you read a passage and you know you've read this thing like, a million times. But you read it one time and something just clicks. Like for the first time, like that, the word jumps off the page and you just kind of skimmed it before. It just jumps off. And this, 
had jumped off because I was wrestling with this. In Colossians chapter two, the apostle Paul says, oops, I'm, I'm not gonna pick that up. Okay, this is what he says. He says, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to this world, do you submit to its rules? And this is what caught me right here. He said, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Those are the three things that I wanted to tell my church. I'm like, church, can you please do not handle that and do not touch that and do not taste that? And Paul said, these rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based merely on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. And this is what just got my attention. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Guys, what Paul is saying here is vitally important. Right before he moves on to chapter three, which is a whole section on Christian sanctification, what it looks like to start to look like Christ, to embody the person of Christ, and to be made in the image of Christ. Right before he moves on to sanctification, Paul says, lists don't work. And my dilemma really was, I can't give the church lists. This is, and our church was filled with people that ran to San Francisco from their religious backgrounds. That ran, that were, that a lot of them grew up in Christian homes. I can't tell you how many pastor's kids I met in San Francisco that were running. And so they had heard lists their entire life and they thought that was the way you got in. You got in through lists. If you do these things in this way, you're in. And they're in the church and now they're falling in love with Jesus and I'm just gonna say, hey, now, now hear the list. And you're like, oh, you duped me, you tricked me. You brought me in with all this grace of Christ talk and following the way of Jesus talk and then you duped me with lists. And I just couldn't do it. And I get here and Paul's saying, it doesn't work. It's actually, lists are a way a cult would do Christianity. That is not real Christianity. So I kept on reading. And what I read next, something just, something just went off in my heart. Because what happens with the list is that lists speak to the environment and not to the heart. You can control your life with lists, but that will never get to your heart. That'll control your environment, but not your heart. And so Paul says this in Colossians 3. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, what does it say? When Christ, what? Who is your life. When Christ, who is your life, comes, then you will appear with him in glory. What is Paul getting at? Paul is getting at a better way. Paul is getting at a better way to live the life of faith. It's not just a, 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 it's a better way than don't do this and don't do that. And I believe what Paul is getting at is the thrust of the New Testament. I believe what Paul is getting at is all the teachings of Jesus. It's the, the entire Sermon on the Mount, the thrust of the letters of the churches and the way that Paul brings about sanctification. And it's, it can be summed up in a simple sentence. This is what Paul is getting at and this is what I started to realize that I needed to teach a whole church of young professionals and young freelancers and young people that were filling my church in San Francisco. And it might seem a little new agey, but this is what I think, this is what I think Paul's getting at. Be who you are. Be who you are. This is what the New Testament is teaching us. As you're in Christ, now our job, our call is to be who we are. This is what Paul is getting at in every letter. The whole book of 1 Corinthians is just teaching the people of God that live in this sinful, crazy city that's kind of like San Francisco. Hey, would you know your identity in Christ and be who you are? This is what Jesus was saying when he said, you are the salt of the earth. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Now, just be who you are. You're salt, you are salt. I made you salt, be salt. And then I was reading this book by Henry Nouwen, who I love his writings. And I came across this quote that he wrote, and this quote probably out of any extra biblical writing changed my life more than anything. He said this. He said, from the moment we claim the truth of being the beloved, we are faced with the call to become who we are. 
And this is what Nalan is saying. Once, once you come to that place in your life, when, you've, when, when you hear, you've heard the call of God to become the beloved of God, and you said you, you've accepted the love and the grace of Christ, now your whole, your whole life is to be consumed with, now become who you are. You are loved by God and accepted by God and put in right relationship with God and not by your own doing, not because of your parents, not because of your college, not because you have the right desires or the right education or the right attractions, not because you have the right job, but because of the sacrificial atoning death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's who you are. If you've placed your trust in Christ, you belong to God and now our call is to become who we are. See, we have to live as if who we are in Christ is the truest thing about us. See, there are other things that are true about you. It's true that the things that you do, a lot of you guys are in school right now. All of you are you're in school right now. Um, and that, that can consume who you are. You're a student. And that's true about you. And a lot of things write on grades, and a lot of things write on where am I going next, and a lot of things write on, write on what's my career going to be after this, and where is this college going to take me next. That's true, but it's not the truest. A lot of things that we have are, tr- are true about us, but they're not the truest things. A lot of you guys have abuse in your past. And there's some people that say, just deny the lies and, and, and live in truth, but a lot of the, let's just be honest, a lot of those things are true about you. You were maybe abused, you were You've, you have failed in your life. Those things are true, but they're not the truest. And a lot of things that we desire, I think we find our identity in what we desire. I know that this is the town that I minister in. Well, I desire this person, so then I must be that. Or I desire this person, so then I must be that. And we give labels to it. And then we live as if that is the truest thing about us when it's not. Our looks, our past, our abuse, our disorders, whatever these things are may be true, but they are not the truest. Whatever you believe is the truest thing about you will be your functioning identity. And I'm here to tell you that according to the scriptures, the identity is safely secured in the God who loves you. Timothy Keller put it well when he said this, identity is a complex set of layers, for we are many things. Our occupation, ethnic identity, etc., are part of who we are, but we assign different values to these components, and thus Christian maturing is the process in which the most fundamental layer of our identity becomes our self-understanding as a new creature in Christ, along with all our privileges in him. What he's saying there is that there are all these things that might be true about you. There's all these things that, yes, your ethnic, your ethnic background and your desires, your propensities, all these things are true, but what, what Christian understanding is is pushing down the truest thing, our identity in Christ, down to the fundamental layer of who we are and then living out of that truth, trusting that in faith. That is who we are. Not, our identity is not based on moving parts or emotions or conflicting desires. All of us have conflicting desires. All of us want to be like in shape but eat ginormous burritos that are bigger than our heads. Like those two things don't go together. You realize that, right? Uh, they might go together for you until you hit 30 and then they won't go together anymore. I'll just tell you that. We all have these competing desires. We want to be known as very smart and educated but we also want to watch like reality television. Like those two things don't go together. We are bundles of conflicting desires. All of us are. And so here's what Paul says to the church in, in Colossae. Christ is your life. And so let me ask you a question. It's rhetorical. I don't want you to answer it out loud. I just want you to think about it. Is Christ your life? Is Christ your life? And before you get all sad and feel condemned, you're like, oh, he's not my life. Or you get really puffed up with pride because you had a really good devotional this morning. You're like, no, I read a devotional today. I am killing it right now as a Christian. <laughs> it's, it's a really loaded question. I think everyone in here would say, is Christ your life? Really, you'd say no with a caveat, but I want him to be. And I, if I asked you why no, why isn't Christ your life? You're like, well, I still sin. I still go my own way. I still want to do what I want to do. I don't pray enough. I still don't forgive certain people. But this is not what Paul says in Colossians 3. It is not what the New Testament proclaims. Paul did not say Christ is your life if you accomplish A and you give away B and you forgive C. He proclaims over you and I that Christ is your life. It's a fact. It's called an indicative. And this is review for some, but this is so important for you to get. 
There's indicatives in scriptures and there's imperatives in, in scriptures. Christians love the imperatives. We geek out on the imperatives. We love it when somebody comes in and starts slapping us around as Christians. You should be doing this. Wham, and we download all their sermons. We're like, I, and we, that's why when we get like really, really like sh- lukewarm in our faith, we read James because James just calls us an idiot and says, you gotta do it this way. And you're like, I love James. He just like slaps me. We, we Christians just l- are addicted to the, what do we have to do? And we don't get up from our devotional until I know, what do I have to do? And indicative is something that has already been indicated or declared about you. It's a fact. It's a truth. An imperative is something we are to do, a command. We love commands. We love to be told what to do in the Bible. We love those. But the whole thrust of the New Testament, I would say even the Bible, is the truths about us. Every single, every single imperative is based on an indicative. Every single thing that you're told to do is based on something true about you. Everything. So, if you look at like sexual immorality in scripture and Paul says to flee sexual immorality, he said that is what? That's an imperative, flee sexual immorality. But he doesn't do that before he tells you, oh, by the way, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Christ is in you. That's who you are. Based on who you are, now live this way. When we are told in Scripture to have unity and humility, Paul says in Philippians 3 that we would have the mind of Christ. But right before that, he says, have this mind in you, which is yours in Christ. It's yours. Be who you are. And what is the list to end all lists? The Ten Commandments. How does the Ten Commandments start? Who wants to give a guess? How does the Ten Commandments start? Amen. Thank you. Got one right. This is a college. Of course, you're going to get it. Oh, look at that. Claps. There we go. The Ten Commandments start with, I am the Lord your God. The Ten Commandments start like this. Um, You're no longer slaves. The Ten Commandments don't start with, you shall not. Don't have any other gods before me. The Ten Commandments start with, this is who you are. You were once in bondage. You were once a slave, but now I've freed you. You are mine. I've bought you, and I brought you to myself. Because you're no longer slaves, live this way. Because that's not who you are anymore, take a Sabbath. And Sabbaths are just amazing. What God says to the children of Israel is, you know what? You're not allowed to take Sabbaths as slaves. Sabbaths and days off are for people that are free. But guess what? You're now free. And you were once slaves, and you're not slaves anymore. You're free. Take a rest. Do you guys rest? Like, take a day off and go, I'm not my performance. I'm not my grades. I'm not my past. I'm not what I produce. I'm not my social media image. I am in Christ, and I can rest in that fact. When I started to teach this to my church, people walk up to me and were angry at me, like physically disturbed. And they said, no one ever told us this before. No one's ever told me. I've been addicted to what I have to do. But you're saying that I just can be. I can like, I could be a human being, not a human doing. I can just be. This is the call of the New Testament. I believe this is the call of Jesus, is that he draws us in to go, this is who you are in me, so be who you are. And then from that flows all the things that we're called to do. From that, it's like, because of who I am, I can do all these things. And this message, I believe, liberates. I believe this message is truer than the identity labels that we all give each other, that we might even give ourselves. There's things that are true about you, but they are not the truest. The truest thing about you is that you are beloved of God. And that might be simple, and you might look for three application points. I'm not going to give you any application points. I'm going to say, rest in that. God, I thank you for these students. I thank you for this college. I pray that we'd rest in who we are in Christ. I know that's sometimes more difficult than a list of things to do. But I pray that as we walk and we walk through the, this beautiful campus, we would just hear the voice of God that says, You are my son, you are my daughter, and in you, I'm well pleased. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.